Next up, we have Alejandro Aguilera. Um, he has been involved in harm reduction and HIV prevention and care for nearly three decades. Uh, his, use, his unique lived experiences have not only been captured as a protagonist in the biographical novel, Transcending Me, but have also enabled him to both um, access and engage marginalized and underserved communities. His harm reduction principles and practices are strongly connected and centered around spirituality, holism, and natural environment. He currently works as a planning and social justice advisor for the St. Paul Ramsey County Public Health and continues his work as a needs assessment and evaluation chair for the Minnesota Council for HIV AIDS Care and Prevention. Sorry. Yay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, and thank you for the uh, Department of Human Services for having invited me. Thank you, Carmen Robles, as well, for having invited me to be part of the planning group. Um, I don't know which one I'm going to use because of the ADHD, right? So <laughs> I'm being overstimulated right now. Um, but at any rate, um, where to start? I kind of started. Uh, working on this presentation, um, and the title came to me last night, like around 10, right? As I was looking at a bunch of candy that was set up for the training that was gonna happen for corrections today, and I thought if I eat that candy, it's gonna come undone, right? Like it's gonna, it's like, you know, sugar is like the root of all evil. And so uh, I'm like, don't eat the candy, but it just kept winking at me, and so I just kept, you know, eating a little bit at a time, and, uh, and I arrived at this title with it. But before we go into this, I just, um, uh, something that came up was, what is health, really? Um, because that's what we should all strive for, uh, for public health and social services, also for the health of the person. And uh, the other team that I'm a part of, which is the health and wellness team, Paul Allwood heads that, um, again, health, right? And um, America is kind of obsessed, or I shouldn't say America, the United States is obsessed with um, acronyms. I'm going to switch to this one. Can I switch to this one? Can I switch to this one? Uh, oh. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah, yeah. And so I thought, okay, what is health? And in relation to um, what we're doing here. And what I came up with was holding empathy and love through hardship, right? And that's what we have to do in terms of addiction um, or substance use disorder, however um, you are calling it. I do like the shift, I do like the change, and I did comb my presentation to make sure that I didn't use the word addict, right? Because that so, um, uh, holds so much stigma. So thank you so much for saying that. Um, and so, I, I just want us now, because then together, right, I'm also a big member, um, or I shouldn't say a big member, I'm a, I'm a member of the leather community, and one of the leather community mottos is um, uh, in it together, right, or uh, uh, together we are stronger, community first. So in order to do some sort of like community thing and to maybe like get you to break the ice with your neighbor, why don't you all hold hands with your neighbor and create like little circles at your table, if you will. We're just going to breathe a little bit. We're going to hold empathy and love towards each other, the work that we do, right, through this hardship. And I also want to say thank you. I know that there's... Um, um, a mixed group of both Latino and, and non-Latino people in the group, the Latino people that show up, that showed up, continue showing up, right? Continue showing up at the table and having our voice be heard. Uh, our native brethren as well continue showing up to these tables. And then those of you who are non-Latino or non-native, uh, non-indigenous people, thank you so much for helping us undo these disparities and this uh, racism, classism, right? Because th ultimately that's what it is, and, um, and, and the stigma. And so in undoing all these things, thank you for showing up today, right? So we're just going to breathe in, just breathe in, and breathe out. And breathe in, and breathe out. Breathing in, you know you're breathing in. 
And breathing out, you know that you're breathing out. You can close your eyes if you want, it's okay. Because the person whose hand you're holding is you. The I is you and the USI, right? We're all one big network. There's no separation, really. So keep breathing, breathe in and breathe out. And think about holding empathy and love towards yourself first. Which then, because of what I said previously, it means you're holding empathy and love for the person whose hand you're holding because they are you. Keep breathing. And now start thinking about all the people that you help, or you, whether it be your family. I kind of like that um, uh, simple theory, right? That begins with the family, from the family, from the child, from child to the family, the family to the community, the community to the nation, the nation to the world, right? We've seen this echoed through many indigenous people's thoughts on both sides of the Atlantic and the Pacific. And thinking about all those people, hold that empathy, that love, see their faces, see them smile. Yes, they share a lot of overcoming, right? And a lot of um, fears, a lot of hardship, a lot of inequity. But at the same time, there's so much love in them. There's so much resilience, there's so much hope. And there is health in all of them and in all of us once we learn how to hold empathy and love through the tests that life gives us through that hardship. So if you have your eyes closed, maybe gently open them, gently letting go of your neighbor's hands, maybe smiling, right? Someone once said that a smile is the beginning of peace. <laughs> Thank you for entertaining that with me. Um, so now we'll, we'll get to the presentation, but those were things that I was thinking about, right? And the title too, the title was something that, like I said, it came to me like at 10 o'clock at 90 Plato Boulevard West, second floor in the star room, surrounded by chocolate and these like cosmic ray wands, you know, they had those for the, you know, because I've been stressing that for ADHD, that they have at tables things for you to play with. And that means that I'm not paying attention. That actually means that I am paying attention right, as someone with ADHD. So overcoming, because that's, you know, I, I kept thinking about overcoming, right, and hope, and that we can get through this together, because together we are stronger, um, and we need to resist, that's another one, right, um, all these bombs that can keep getting thrown our way. So overcoming through indigenous harm reduction, our magic in our words. Next slide, yeah. So um, harm reduction, it's a paradigm shift, in approaching substance use. And it's a term, notes, right? The conflict of the type A, type B person in me. Uh, there we go. <laughs> the idea of harm reduction was first introduced to the world in the late 1980s and in the decade that followed. In 1989, for example, the Dutch sociologist Eddie Engelsman presented the concept with the following words. The Dutch being sober and pragmatic people, they opt rather for a realistic and practical approach to the drug problem than for a moralistic or over-dramatized one. Engelsmann presents harm reduction as the opposite of a moralistic control policy based on false premises. According to him, the sensible harm reduction approach to drugs in the Netherlands is built on a recognition that drug-related problems are not a matter for the police and the judicial system but primarily a question of health and social welfare. Um, Newcomb in Liverpool, then in 1992, goes on to say that harm reduction has its main roots in the scientific public health model with deeper roots in humanitarianism and libertarianism. It therefore contrasts with abstentionism, which is rooted more in the punitive law enforcement model and in medical and religious paternalism. 
The paradigm presented by harm reduction has, as I see, three main themes, right? So it has harm reduction and abstinence, harm reduction autonomy and responsibility, and finally, harm reduction and social integration. Lately, I feel almost that harm reduction has exclusively been reduced or captured by exchanging a used needle for an unused needle. And notice how impeccable I am with my words, <laughs> right? That I carefully use used and unused as opposed to dirty and clean, right? Because no substance use um, disorder person, <laughs> me, <laughs> is dirty to begin with, right? So why keep using those words? So harm reduction to me is more than just syringe exchanges, although syringe exchange is part of it. Um, having grown up in Switzerland, syringe exchanges uh, were a, a common thing for me, and, and then injection sites as well. Um, but let's look at harm reduction today as defined by the Harm Reduction Coalition. Next slide. So harm reduction is a set of practical strategies and ideas aimed at reducing negative consequences associated with drug use. Harm reduction is also a movement for social justice built on a belief in and respect for the rights of people who use drugs. Harm reduction also incorporates a spectrum of strategies, from safer use, to managed use, to abstinence, to meet drug users where they're at, addressing conditions of use along with the use itself. Because harm reduction demands that interventions and policies designed to serve drug users reflect specific individual and community needs, there is no universal definition of or formula for implementing harm reduction. Next slide. Principle central to harm reduction, and we'll just, yep, just keep, keep, keep clicking, accepts that licit and illicit drug use is part of our world, for better or for worse, and we choose to work to minimize the harmful effects rather than simply ignore or condemn them. It understands drug use as a complex, multifaceted phenomena that encompasses a continuum of behaviors from severe abuse to total abstinence, and acknowledges that some ways of using drugs are clearly safer than others. It also establishes quality of individual and community life and well-being, not necessarily cessation of all drug use, as the criteria for successful interventions and policies. It calls for the non-judgmental, non-coercive provision of services and resources to people who use drugs and the communities in which they live in order to assist them in reducing attendant harm. Next slide. Thank you. Ensures, it also ensures that drug users and those with a history of drug use, whether present or past, are routinely present at the table and that they have a real voice in the creation of programs and policies designed to serve them. So subject matter experts are very important, right? Um, it also affirms that drug users themselves are the primary agents of reducing the harms of their drug use and seeks to empower users to share information and support each other in strategies which meet their actual conditions of use. And this share information kind of reminds me of the harm reduction conference over in Manoman and White Earth Nation in terms of that sharing our knowledge makes us indeed stronger. Recognizes that the realities of poverty, class, racism, social isolation, past trauma, sex-based discrimination, and other social inequalities affect both people's vulnerability to and capacity for effectively dealing with drug-related harm. Lastly, it does not attempt to minimize or ignore the real and tragic harm and danger associated with licit and illicit drug use. Next slide. So, harm reduction take-home points. There was a lot that I kind of gave you based on what the Harm Reduction Coalition does, and I, I'm pretty sure that everyone in the room knows what the Harm Reduction Coalition is. Yes? No? Do you want me to? to no. um, and it basically came out of um, a group of people very much like myself and Jamie, right? Um, it was founded in 1993, and it was a group of needle exchange provider advocates and drug users that came together, and they thought, how can we create a system that overcomes stigma, right? And that we can advocate for policy and public health reform. Um, 
And so it has become a national capacity building organization that works to promote the health and the dignity of individuals and communities who use or are impacted by drugs. So these are the main take home points. Framework for working with people who use drugs. Strives to reduce consequence of risky behavior. It includes strategies, philosophies, and social change agendas. It ensures the inclusion and empowerment of drug users in programmatic planning and public health policy making. Next slide. And so harm reduction seeks to maximize social and health assistance disease prevention and education while minimizing repressive and punitive measures. Harm reduction does not approach drug use as a clinical or medical uh, issue, right? Or criminal, sorry, criminal and, or medical issue. And that discussion centers around problem solving risk factors. Next slide. Bottom line, just click. Harm reduction recognizes the right for comprehensive, non judgmental medical and social services and the fulfillment of basic needs of all individuals and communities, including users, their loved ones, and the communities affected by drug use. Harm reduction supports the integration of individual and community needs through all support services, thereby breaking up the established, siloed, white centric approach to public health. And harm reduction has a ripple effect within communities. And hence, we get to see, even in terms of peer support uh, navigators, right? Next slide. Harm reduction central assumptions. So I'm kind of hammering you with it, right? Public health alternatives to moral, criminal, and deceased models of drug use and addiction. It recognizes abstinence as an ideal outcome, but accepts other alternatives. Partners with both active and abstinent drug users to obtain input on programs and policy and employs <laughs> both, um, well, mostly abstinent, right? But if there's someone active, then you're less judgmental about it, right? Because the bottom line, stigma makes you think that drug users are not people like us, right? That a Dolce Gabbana wearing outfit dude would be a meth head, right? So, but, <laughs> next slide. Harm reduction, practical overview now. So, harmful consequences of drug use can be placed in a continuum. The goal of this is to move along the continuum by taking steps to reduce harm. Next slide. So, borrowing this from uh, North Carolina, um, we have moderation, right? Abstinence, excess. Everything's good in moderation, right? So, but if you start going up, then there's excess, and then that can lead even to like premature death. And then if we move this route, we're decreasing the risk. Next slide. Uh, people who use drugs get demonized a lot, so I thought I should use some demon quotes, right? So demons are like obedient dogs. dogs. You can tell English is not my first language. Um, they come when they are called. Then from Mark Twain, habit, is habit, and not to be flung out of the window by any man, but coaxed downstairs a step at a time. Even Samuel Beckett says that habit is the chain that ties a dog to its own vomit. Next slide. All you have is your fire, we all do, right? And the place we need to reach, some of us know what that place is, others are in the process of discovering it. Don't you ever tame your demons, Always keep them on a leash. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. <laughs> all right. So then all this, right, harm reduction, everything, and I kept thinking, how am I going to jump from that to indigenous um, harm um, reduction, right? And so I was like, all right, stigma, right? Because once they put in your head, and thank you, Jesse, for um, in North Carolina, I'm not here, but, um, for helping with this. Once they put it in your head so many times, you hear it over and over again, it's like a recording, right? I'm a crackhead, I sell my body. Once you keep hearing this recording over again, you start to believe it and you start to live it, right? You're a loser, you're unworthy, you don't deserve love. And so you begin to believe all this stuff. So where's the hope, right? How does the resilience emerge? How do we enrich this journey? Um, and then uh, in terms of cleanliness, you can never be clean because you were never dirty to begin with. <laughs> and next slide. 
So now, indigenous harm reduction. Oh, back to my notes. <laughs> oh, before, well, no, yes. No, oh God, ADHD, I tell you. <laughs> and, and the big thing, why harm reduction has worked, let's go to the previous one so that um, we just leave it there for now. It's because all of a sudden, drug users, both active and, and, and abstinent drug users, kind of proved to the government that harm reduction sites were less expensive than the other alternatives, right? And so all of a sudden, people who were injecting drugs say, hey, in a year, we can spend like almost $2,000 in what then, if someone were to get, let's say, HIV or Hep C, what the government would have to spend in order to help that person live and get their medicine and their treatment, right? And so th to me, that's really revolutionary uh, that it was like the people without the degrees that kind of showed this information. Um, and that then, it, and ultimately, it's a matter of money, right? Everything's a matter of money, which is kind of annoying thing. But, um, but, but they have shown remarkable uh, success in reducing HIV, Hep C transmission, right? Um, unlike other programs. Um, and so what they've done is that they've identified what is pragmatically effective and they're respecting the human rights of persons who use drugs because they are persons who use drugs, right? The whole IDU thing, it kind of eliminates that. I was talking about demonization and all that. Yes, we might be able to see and conjure demons, but we are not demons ourselves. We are humans. And so respecting that our human rights, the human rights of a person who uses drugs, is imperative if we are to move forward. So then I thought, what, what is our magic? What, is our, what are our words, right? What are, and so I, I kind of arrived in just harm reduction. It's not something um, original. It's something that I have to thank um, um, my native peoples here in, in the um, upper Midwest for helping me discover not only in terms of my own journey in, in gender as a two-spirited male, but also in terms of finding other helpers. So as an herbalist, I studied um, animal medicine, right? Because that's how it's seen. And so then how do you do this? And then I found out there's a group in British Columbia that was looking at this work. So this, nothing original. I'm just kind of rehashing it and giving it to you. I'm shamelessly stealing in order to share with you, right? <laughs> so animal medicine might have been erased from Western and Chinese medicines. However, it has remained a vital part for all the peoples of the Americas, also Ayurvedic traditions, right? Uh, recently, last year, was well, toward the end of last year, that I went to um, the city of Minneapolis, and we were discussing about ayahuasca interventions, you know, through the Church of Brazil here and Dr. Dennis McKenna. Um, I also want to make sure that I use the word, to make clear for you that I use the word indigenous and indigenous peoples to highlight and credit the work of international indigenous human rights defenders who made the United Nations Declaration on the Human Rights of Indigenous Peoples a reality that many nation states, including Canada, excluding us, now endorse. <laughs> United Nations. That's why I said including Canada, I didn't write excluding us. Including Canada, <laughs> uh, the United Nations Declaration of the Human Rights of Indigenous People is based on international human rights laws and standards and reinterprets these baseline standards for human rights within an indigenous context. We understand that health, rights, and justice must be central to conversations about harm reduction. Animal medicine does not only speak to all the native peoples of the Americas, but most importantly, it reminds us that we, as Latinx peoples, our brothers and sisters to our American Indian brethren here, and that we share a lot in common. So I thank you so much, Shirley, for opening this whole conference with that, of saying how much we share in common, because the reality is, it's a Roman tactic, right? Divide and conquer. As people of color are divided, we are conquered. And, and what a great, tragic, awful, heart-wrenching parallel to see what they're doing to children now, which is what they did to Native American children, what they also did to black children, all right? So, um, okay, now, next slide. So here we go. Indigenous harm reduction. It's a process of integrating indigenous or shamanic, if you wanna, if wanna use that, right? Shamanic um, cultural knowledge and values into the strategies of harm reduction. It also, 
It's uh, spiritual principles and practices that facilitate conversations regarding substance use and harm reduction. Next slide. So basically, they center around spirituality, holism, and nature. I'm going to go quickly through these. Next one. Harm reduction learn is a learning model via an indigenous or shamanic lens. So it reflects animal totems. Why am I standing in front of it? Jeez. Um, reflecting animal teachings. It reflects animal values. Notice the kitty, the sheep, and the rabbit. <laughs> and it is uh, supporting sensitive conversations around substance use. It's supporting cultural heritage and connectivity, right? Because even recently I was uh, involved, thank you to Sam Robertson, uh, involved with MDH in terms of what do we call now the deaths of despair and disconnectedness, right? So people who use drugs are seen as disconnected. So then I'm like, ah, this gives connectivity back to culture. And every time that I feel, where's Dr. Hector? There he is. Every time that I feel like calling up a dealer and, and using, right, what do I do? I go to places like El Burrito Mercado and I have and I have my food. I, I really do. And I start talking in Spanish, and I start singing Spanish songs, and I start, you know, it's almost like my ancestors, which I carry on my back, are saying, don't go that route. You've been there. You've written that chapter in your book. Move forward, right? And so then this gives me, if society sees us as disconnected and in despair, we need hope, right? We need light. We need hope. We need connectedness. And lastly, it supports a journey through and out of substance use. Not a destination, right? I'll keep stressing that, that it's a journey rather than a destination. Yeah, I'm more process-oriented. Okay. <laughs> Next slide, please. So meaning, medicine, and magic, an indigenous archetypal framework. Because you can begin to understand that, right? And there's, again, my ADHD brain going on, like, the whole Jungian thing, and then shamans, druids, and all these peoples around the world trying to understand what it is to be human, the big tail, Mayan tale, right, that, that all the animals gave a gift to man, but man was still sad because man wanted more and more. He keeps wanting more. But all the animals have given us what they can give. All the plants have given us what they can give. And yet we are not happy. Hmm. Hmm. And so then we seek, well, I won't go into that round. Anyway, um, uh, next slide. <laughs> I'm going to go hide out back here. <laughs> so, wolf. Um, oh, what happened there? It's not colored. My notes are colored. Oh, there we go. Huh. So wolf, no, <laughs> it's a symbol of loyalty, perseverance, relationships, a pathfinder, independent exploration, and sharing of knowledge with the community. It teaches you to listen to your inner voice and find your own power and strength by facing your deepest fears and practicing sincerity. Healing requires working together as one heart and one mind, because a wolf lives in a pack, right? And wolves travel in packs. Something interesting, I don't know if you knew this about wolves, is that when wolves travel, and this teaches a lot about leadership for those that work in public health or for state or government agencies, that in the front are the oldest, the weakest, the sick, right, of a pack. And they set the pace for the whole pack, because you don't want to leave them behind, right? You don't want them to die alone back there. So they set the pace for the pack. Next come a, a bunch of strong ones, right? Kind of like a front barrier. After that is the youngest ones, so the babies, the new ones. So they're being protected by a barrier of really strong ones. Next come even stronger ones, and, and you might say even the ones that are kind of preferred for mating purposes. So they're being protected, right? So you have like one, two, three, four. So even the, the really young ones are ahead of them. Um, and then last comes the alpha wolf, right? So as a leader, he can see more from behind than he come from the front, right? This strategy ensures that no one is left behind, regardless if they are all black or with white spots or a brown spot or... A, all are ahead of the leader. It shows that the strongest leaders can observe from behind while letting others develop at their own pace. Think of that. You can actually see and direct more efficiently from the back because you have the best view of the pack or tribe than if you were actually way out front alone. 
Um, another thing in terms of, of wolf is that of the land animals, the wolf has the strongest supernatural powers and it is the most accomplished hunter. Also, wolves don't need to say too much. Just a look, a uh, growl, a uh, little bark communicates a lot. That's, yeah, snarling, you know, communicates a lot, right? Um, wolf spirit is a shapeshifter. He adapts to the energies of the forest. Wolf is a trailblazer and a pathfinder by nature, led by his deep intuition deep into the dark forests. He knows his way both in and out of those dark forests. Wolf teaches you to bring your inner voice and find your personal power and strength by facing your deepest fears and practicing sincerity. Wolves have also a special connection with winged creatures. And we'll, that's why you'll see, we're moving from land to um, air. And so you'll get to, I'll get to share a lovely tale with you at the very end. Next slide, please. So Black Panther, and I do understand that some of these symbols like Panther, like cougar, um, applies more to peoples of um, Central and South America, more so than the peoples up here, right? Um, but Black Panther, or Panther, it's a symbol of courage, grace, challenge, feminine power, and rites of passage. It teaches us to become comfortable in our own skin, beauty, and grace, reminding us to pace ourselves, love ourselves, and reclaim our power. Healing requires trusting ourselves to explore and embrace our fears of the unknown, thereby allowing our inner voice and arising inner messages to guide the way. The harm reduction principles to explore is to allow room for alternative safer substances or reduce the frequency of drug use. So Panther, is, uh, is she reminds us, so it's interesting, I begin with a wolf with this he, and then we move into Panther with a she because the fierce feminine power that resides in each and every one of us Become comfortable with that creative, self-nurturing power. Also, um, the mention of water earlier today, black panthers like to calm themselves in water. Um, they are great swimmers and they dive in order to uh, quiet themselves. Black panther is also quick in action, but also you have to learn how to pace yourself and not to push too hard on one task at a time. Allow for the messages to come through. It is time that you awaken, that we all awaken, and we start writing a new chapter, a chapter of hope and solution for the epidemic we are now facing. Next slide, please. Bears. Now, bears are a symbol of strength, family, connection, and protection. They teach us to take a stand against any injustice we see to help protect those who cannot protect themselves. Healing is embedded in culture and tradition strength-based approach and working with harm reduction. And it recognizes culture and tradition as intergenerational strengths that are methods of harm reduction. So with bear, we have leadership, family, lunar magic, right? Bears have great maternal instincts. They're very fierce in protecting their family. So it kind of reminds us to take a stand against injustices that we see and to extend the gift not only to our immediate family, but to other families right, to other creatures around us. The, also, the uh, bear retreats into the caves, right, into the womb of Mother Earth to decompress, to evolve, to mature, reminding us that we also need to take that time to decompress, to evolve, because if we don't evolve, we will devolve. Hibernation, right, it's a very notion asks us to examine where in your life you can build up reserves. Staying on the center path is an illusion. So Bear teaches us to learn how to gracefully, gracefully flow in and out of times and seasons of excess and seasons of scarcity. They're very extremely clever. They possess an incredible sense of smell, which then reminds us of the importance of the sense of smell. That's the strongest sense because smells, sense of smell is the only sense that triggers memories. Right? Next slide. Looking at eagle, it's a symbol of spiritual connection, knowledge, knowledge of magic, wisdom, freedom, and seeing higher truths. It teaches us to reconnect with our spiritual path through self-reflection, spiritual awareness, but remaining grounded in reality. Healing requires time, patience, and reflection. It's the healing principle there. Paths of wellness is a journey, not a destination. 
It aligns with the human reduction principle that support may take many ongoing opportunities. It also means that in our professional work practice, we take the time to reflect on our own emotions and allow room for patience in our engagement with people who are using substances. So the importance of developing cultural humility or cultural sensitivity towards people who use substances. Next slide. And also, well, mm, previous slide. As we begin to soar and rise, right, out of our current situation and limited perspective, you have to ask your heart to shine and a direction to follow. You will be able to see hidden spiritual truths and connect with spirit guides and wise teachers along the way. When you do that inner work to reclaim your personal power, you are able to see past old limiting beliefs that hold you back. Next slide. The last animal out of the five animals that I'm giving you is raven. Not uh, uh, common. I was told that for people in the room maybe to think of hawk. But raven symbolizes magic, mystery, creation, transformation, adaptability, fearlessness. It's a trickster as well, similar to fox. He guides us to get in touch with life's mysteries as you develop your ability to perceive the subtle magic and energy shifts. She also teaches you that those around you are reflecting back at you the things you need to learn the most. It also encourages you to get out of your familiar space and to find messages elsewhere. It also uh, reminds us that you have the power to transform any manipulative tendencies you feel into a way to empower and inspire others. Ravens have also advanced vocal abilities for birds, making over a hundred different vocalizations. Try singing or learning a different language. Try singing the songs of your people, right? In what ways can you use your voice differently? Ravens are also attributed in terms of just little tales here. Apollo, god of prophecy, right, for the Greeks, he would send out ravens, which were white, five minutes, which were white, and then he would turn them black, right? Odin had two ravens, thought and mind, who would go through the day and report back. Um, human right principle, mistakes will be made along the way. We do not to carry, need to carry the burdens of the past. And the path of wellness, again, is a journey, not a destination. Next slide. All right, I'm going to go through these quick. So, learning components, quickly. Wolf is relationships and connectivity, in brief. Outreach services, in addition to site-based services. Services need to be human-centered, focusing on cultural humility, allowing the people that you are trying to service to speak for themselves and to self-identify. Strategies and services based on cultural humility, I already said that. Acknowledge relationships and understanding the impact of cultural realities. Next slide. <laughs> so, Black Panther, about pacing and self-care. Means exploring other methods of harm reduction, safer route of drug administration, alternative safer substances, reducing frequency of substance use, reducing intensity of substance use, and leading ultimately to reduction of harmful consequences of substance use. So Black Panther, not only does it help substance users face their own fears, but she is there to help overcome the key element of drug-related stigma. Right, because stigma is significant part of the experience of injection drug users. Understanding stigma is therefore important so as to avoid reinforcing it and to better counteract its negative psychosocial effects. Components quickly without going into them because I'm running out of time. Blame and moral judgment, right? The whole thing, why say no, you know, why, why are they, why can't they stop? And criminalizing it, pathologizing it, um, patronizing it, and uh, in terms of overcoming fear and isolation, right? If we then begin to undo stigma, what we're going to see is we're going to see a willingness to access these services that we offer and that people will show up and they will not hide their behavior and they will be honest with families, friends, professionals, doctors, and counselors. Next slide. Er, I'm going to do it. Bear, focusing on strength and protection, wellness focused and holistic in nature. It's the strategies and services we need to think about. Incorporating indigenous or shamanic beliefs, values, and practices. This includes medicinal plants, ceremony, and elder consultation and guidance into the programs that we create. 
incorporating elders, two-spirited peoples, and other cultural members to guide and participate in the initiatives and programs generated via harm reduction. EGLE is knowledge and wisdom. Strategies and services need to be trauma-informed. You need to support individuals and communities, whether they are in their healing, wherever they're at in their healing journey. Remember, the journey is far more important and rewarding than the destination. Eagle also reminds us, like Panther, that stigma is there and that shame is a reality that we face. Developing cultural humility or cultural responsiveness towards substance users is imperative for public health and social service workers. Supporting strategies and services that are evidence-based. Next slide. And last, Raven, substance use, public health concern and social issue. That's what it is, right? We need to view it that way, not as a moral or criminal issue. Um, indigenous harm reduction is a narrative that shifts the healing process into a new yet old paradigm, one in which medicine and magic are deeply interwoven and cannot and will not be surgically separated. Um, and the last, the last little story, how much time do I have? A minute? A minute. Okay, I'll tell you this little story. So it's kind of like bhakti yoga, right? Um, so there's an ancient love story, right, that usually happens between wolves and ravens that we've seen, as I mentioned earlier. But in Denmark, I found an interesting story. There's a mythical creature called the Valraven, which is a half wolf, half raven. And what happened was that a raven apparently ate um, the body of a king that had been killed in battle, and then somehow um, evolved, this creature evolved. Uh, according to the tale, right, the Valraven was born by the raven in the body of a king, creating a half-wolf, half-raven. Its goal is to transform itself into a knight. But to achieve this goal, the Valraven must eat the heart of a child. Many consider them to be terrible animals and that their mission, right, eating the heart of a child is awful. But they are missing the greater symbolism at work. Death is not the end. It is part of the process. When a powerful king or queen calls upon the spirit of the raven and the wolf at death, they ascend into a deeper level of transformation, into a Valraven. It does not seek to literally eat the heart of a child. It seeks to discover and embrace its own inner child and heal the parts of itself that have been abandoned. Once the Valraven has done the work to heal its heart and become whole, it can transform itself into a knight, a warrior of light and love for our world. Thank you.